I am Brad Keeler. She is Kimberly Martin. Next on Director's Cut, you have to put these two things together. Find out what naked mole rats and bio-inspired geotechnics have in common. <laughs> After last week's dalliance in Savannah, where we did one in person, I am back in the palatial Keeler Estate in Virginia for more fun. As you know, on Director's Cut every week, I talk to a different GI member who has a story to tell. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes, you know, actually always it's fun. That's the line. Sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's professional, but it is always fun. If you like what you are going to see today, and I think you will, you want to click on the button that sub sub subscribe click get notifications, we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel, which is very frequently. Today, my guest joins us from the Valley of the Sun, <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona, where she is a senior engineer of innovation and sustainability with Keller North America. And she is also a member of the Geo Institute Local Involvement Committee. We will talk a little bit about that later, but first it is Kimberly Martin, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I am guessing it is a lot warmer there than it is here. It seems like it is winter in Washington, D.C. We're not big fans of that. Yeah, I, it's warmer here for sure. My husband is Canadian, so he always jokes that winter in Arizona is the same as summer in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so we will hit you with 10 questions today. Two of them are the same that we ask every guest, and we start with one of those. Describe your job in 45 seconds. Okay, so first of all, the dream job. So getting to put geotechnical engineering and sustainability together is very awesome and exciting. But in particular, my role at Keller is to develop and implement our sustainability strategy in North America. So we're doing that with our 4P approach, which is aligned to ESG reporting. So the first P is planet or environment, and we do that by focusing on cutting carbon, it's our main focus for now, uh, through innovation and then carbon-focused value engineering. The second P is people or social. So my role with that is to promote DEI at Keller through training and um, policy development, but also we want to enhance our um, basically our positive impact in our local communities. The third P is principles or government. So my role there is to help Keller understand um, basically its exposure to a changing climate through TCFD reporting, which is the task force for climate related financial disclosures. And then the fourth P is profitable projects. So basically, we believe that by focusing on sustainability and doing the right thing, we enhance our value proposition for our customers. So Very good. <laughs> Before we started recording, we talked a little bit how uh, you've got that I word innovation in your job title. And I had that for a long time, too. And it was always a struggle. And people would ask me, what does that mean? So what does it mean to you to have that in your job title? Um, it's actually super exciting, especially fresh out of my PhD, because now when I have these wild ideas, it's asking someone else to do the lab work, <laughs> do the, the research, and I just get to look at the data. So that's really exciting. But, um, you know, with the innovation, the hardest part is probably getting people to come with to me with their ideas and like really taking them forward. So that's been a fun part that's just getting to know people, getting them to trust me to say, okay, let's, what do you have? I know everyone has ideas and people know ways we can do better. So getting them to share and then develop it and get it out to the field. So. And you can get wild with it. So we have to ask, there are lots of fun questions on Director's Cut yeah. too, and we will be sort of Arizona centric, I think today with you, because you live in Arizona. The first one is, what is your favorite type of cactus and why? <laughs> so, of course, it has to be a saguaro, right? They only are in the Sonoran Desert, mostly because they like look so friendly, like they're waving at you and then you get close <laughs> and they are full of spines and prickly. But also, 
like having moved back to Arizona and have a fresh perspective on the desert. Um, in the spring, all their blossoms grow, it looks like on the top of their head and they have these like, looks like they have super funky haircuts. That's <laughs> like, so funny. So anyway, I just love the, uh, just the appeal of the saguaro cactus, so beautiful. So ha have you been to Saguaro National Park? Mm -hmm. Yep. And what was your favorite thing there? Was sell it to everyone watching. <laughs> Well, okay, the colors. I mean, it's just stunning. You're like in the mountains and you see these cactus standing up. But I loved, I lived in New York City for an internship and my hairdresser there was just like, you're from Arizona? It's the funniest place I've ever been. It's just like the cartoons. Like you drive by, it's just like cactus, cactus. <laughs> like, it's so weird. I was like, oh, I guess so. I don't know. But um, yeah, I like the fresh perspective of people who've never been to the desert. Like, this place is crazy. My rebuttal to that is the first time I went to Brooklyn, I was like, this is exactly like it is on TV. And all <laughs> yeah. the stereotypes are correct. Like, it, it, the the steps going up to the houses. Yeah. I was like, this is crazy. Like, I just figured they exaggerated that for TV. That is not the case. <laughs> so if you. If viewers, if you have been to neither Arizona nor New York City, you will have to choose one and see which one is more accurately depicted in the media. <laughs> so the, the other word that you've got at the end of your job title is sustainability. And so we have to ask a question about that, too. And I think just like innovation, everybody has their own definition of sustainability. How has your definition of sustainability in geotech specifically changed since you first started working in that area and critically thinking about it? Yeah, so I wouldn't say the definition has changed, but now that I work as a geotechnical contractor and actually doing the calculations on the carbon footprint of our geotechnical solutions, it's like pretty mind-blowing the impact that we have you know it feels like oh it's just geotechnical engineering like it's kind of like a side thing to our to building and infrastructure but when we get in there and run the numbers it's it's pretty wild so i give our uh, engineers an example with a drilled shaft project where we do the carbon calculations and then i show them with using technologies that we already have today we can cut the carbon footprint in half and it's basically a thousand tons of co2 emissions we can cut and then I remind them that's one project and Keller does 7,000 projects a year across the globe. So that can make us feel really bad or we can use that as inspiration to say, well, like we actually can have a really big impact. So I think getting in there and getting the numbers on the diversity, equity, inclusion side, really seeing how far we have to go and that slow, hard work, but I also see it as a huge opportunity. So it's just been really great to get into the details and see, um, there's a lot we can do in a positive, a positive impact. So society. when you have to when you have to present this to somebody, and I'm specifically thinking of that carbon number that you threw out there before, how do you beyond the actual number itself? How do you get it across to people? How significant that is? Oh, we use this awesome tool from the EPA where you can convert. Um, your carbon footprint into something, right? So one project, I think in Singapore, they cut 3000 tons of carbon and it's the same as driving a car around the equator of the earth, like 350 times. Well, that's, <laughs> that, like, that'd oh. be pretty effective. <laughs> yeah, so using, yeah, we do find like having that, switching it over to something people can kind of more tangibly understand helps a lot. I like that one. And I'm going to go check that out. Your tax dollars at work yeah. providing <laughs> that calculator right there. Exactly. So another, you spent time also in the oil and gas industry. And again, before we turned on the recording here, we talked a little bit about Alberta and the, the oil sands. And maybe this is going to lead us to there too. But the first question I've got for you is what can more traditional civil or geotech firms learn from the oil and gas industry? Yeah, when I was working in oil and gas, I got to do both onshore and offshore. But going offshore, it was just incredible how integrated the geophysics and uh, the traditional geotechnical site investigations uh, were integrated and came together. So you basically would never do a borehole or push a CPT on the offshore without geophysics. And there's huge cost implications for why you wouldn't do that. But I wish that we could bring that to the onshore, just regular geotechnical engineering design because 
there's so much to be gained by that. I think it enhances your design, helps you have a better design, and ultimately for me, use less resource and have a more sustainable solution. So I think that's something that could be learned. For sure. Where do you think the hurdle is to things like that? Do you think it's the onshore people saying, oh, this works over there, but yeah, that, we don't need to worry about that. Or do you think it's something different? Maybe the offshore people just, I, I, because of the nature of their work, pushing the envelope so much that I don't know that there's almost no routine in the process, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, it's more of a given in the offshore because you're often collecting geophysics anyway for the exploration and you can reprocess the data and use it closer to the surface. Um, yeah, it just also, you know, a borehole offshore could be a million dollars for each one. So mm -hmm. the price. <laughs> There's a lot of incentive there. <laughs> There's a lot of That's... But if I think just better capturing that incentive um, the other problem with geophysics is there's uh, many different types. And so even on a site, you kind of know the general geology, you have to take a few different methods out to see which one will actually work. And so I think that kind of turns people off. Like it's not, it's not as straightforward as doing a borehole, <laughs> like dig into the ground, pull out the soil. That's straightforward. But, you know, having to kind of explore that a little bit and the interpretation, but really where the value comes is like integrating that interpretation and going as you move along, getting more information and changing your story. I mean, it's easier on mega type projects where they're long and um, big, but I think I think a lot of it is just knowledge based, letting people know what the value is and what to offer with it and just getting into the habit of it. But also as people focus more on sustainability, putting out geophysics is a very low carbon solution mm -hmm. compared to doing a borehole. Yeah. So if they can do those boreholes smarter, I think hopefully there'll be a push to do that. So it'll get there. But yeah, getting geophysics uh, through the water column, floating along, you know, above the surface of uh, the seabed is easier for certain than doing that onshore through the air column. But um, I don't know, with drones technology and already putting LIDAR and thermal, I think maybe we'll get there. Someone clever. But we'll it's do that. supposed to be you, right? Isn't that the innovation <laughs> part? <laughs> we don't do such a <laughs> See how I just dead that? <laughs> So I think this is this is the part, too, where we're going to ask about the oil sands. Um, okay. You were there, I, th I think, from our conversation when things were insane. Um, I think we can all remember when oil was $130 a barrel in 2006, 2008, uh, whatever bracketed years that were. What, what was a day like when you were up there? I guess you probably weren't in Fort McMurray, probably even north of that. But yeah, yeah. what what was a day like out there at that time? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty wild just being able to get people. The project I was on, of course, Geotech is early with um, any projects So we were in a pretty small man camp, like it was less than 200 people and um, it was winter only. So we had to build ice roads and um, <laughs> we had very like three months to do our work before breakup. So it's pretty intense. We had some times where we just weren't getting the recovery we wanted and our investigation and kind of had to change the whole plan at the last minute because it looked like breakup was going to happen early and a lot of intense conversations between our geotechnical consultant and us. And yeah, it was stressful. 24 hour operations. I usually did a swing shift. So I'd start around noon and then I'd go to midnight so I could see both our crews and um, it was great. I had this <laughs> one night I was out. So a lot of the workers in the oil patch are from Newfoundland and I don't know if you've ever met someone from Newfoundland. Canada. Many times, yeah. <laughs> they have a funny, like interesting way of talking and like they're just such amazing people. So we're out there and I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm Kimberly Martin. I'd well, at the time, Kimberly Stewart with ExxonMobil. And so, you know, their boss is like, this is the client, like, be cool, you know. And he's like, oh, great. And he starts talking to me, of course, like every other word's the cuss word, and it's, <laughs> that's just how they are. And and then he goes, I said, well, I actually live in Calgary. And he's like, oh, me too. Do you ever go to the bar? And I was like, yeah, I guess. And he's like, great. Yeah, I go to the bar too. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, I guess maybe next time I'm down there, I'll see you at the bar. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, thinking... <laughs> we're all like the bar like and I, we walk out and I asked one of the guys I'm like what are they talking about like the, like what what and they're like the Newfie bar 
<laughs> He's lying, there was one bar. I like that because for those of you not up on your Canadian geography, Calgary has what, maybe 700,000 people like to, yeah. to say the bar. The bar. That, that's really good. I like that. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so we'll continue on with some levity now. I, I hope levity. What was your first pet and what do you remember about it? Oh, my first pet was a golden retriever named Soda. And I remember he was just like the sweetest pup like we also had rabbits and they would just like he would just lay down they would just like hop over him <laughs> he wouldn't do anything he just lay there and he loved his tennis balls I do remember that as well there was, our whole backyard was his tennis balls <laughs> I'm waiting for the one person I mean not, this would not be good I guess but who tells me they had a mean golden retriever because I don't <laughs> think they existed they're they're pretty chill we had I mean, pretty chill. Uh, we had a Labrador retriever when I was a kid and she was super chill I mean my little cousins would ride her basically and she was just kind of like <laughs> guess this is what's going on <laughs> <laughs> and who got to name the dog? Was it you or somebody else? No, my older brothers named him. I, I think they actually named him Otis, like from Garfield. And, but then my brother couldn't say it properly and it became Soda somehow. So <laughs> That yeah. is great. Yeah. So the, the other question we ask everybody who comes on the show is how did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? Yeah, so when I was a freshman at the University of Arizona, like I knew I came in as a civil engineer and knew I was doing it and I had this engineering colloquium class and the professor was actually a chemical engineering professor, but he basically was like, here are three things you all need to do. And of course I'm like writing everything down. Okay, he says to do it, I gotta do it. And one of them was get involved. And I was like, okay. So I went to the civil engineering building. I mean, I wasn't really even in civil engineering courses, of course, this is my first year. But it was like a sign, join ASCE, concrete canoe, steel bridge. I'm like, okay. So I joined it my freshman year of college and never looked back. It was pretty fun. That's great. What about yeah. GI? GI, it's 25 years old, right? Yeah. I'm trying to think. Of, that was just coming together, I guess, before I was in college. But hmm, when I was, I guess I would be at University of Texas. When I was at UT for my master's, uh, Dr. Wright wanted to start a GI group for the grad mm -hmm. program. And so Ken Ness, my colleague, he, I think, really started it. And then I was the vice president of GI at UT. So. I feel like vice president's not a bad job in one of those groups. Call the shots from behind the scenes. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's not that much politics in a, in a grad student organization. I don't think so. Yeah. It was more like, please, someone help. So, uh, yeah. So that was really fun. So that can lead into our little pitch here. If you are watching this and you're at an institution that doesn't have a grad student organization, it's really easy to start one. You can find out all the steps at geoinstitute.org. And if you are at an institution that does have a grad student organization, I think you should join it. And I think Kimberly would probably agree. And I we're up so. to, I think, 40 grad student organizations now across the U.S. So you can probably find one at your campus or you can get one started. So we have another Arizona question here. OK. And I, it's another one. I feel like I've asked you the same question about three different things, three different times here. But a lot of people have never seen the Grand Canyon. And for those who have not seen it in their lives, how do you put it into words? When you, I'm sure that's the other question you get after people are done talking to you about cacti. They ask you about <laughs> the Grand Canyon. What do you tell them it's like? Usually I just say it's breathtaking every time. So when I, my husband's Canadian, so we flew out, I flew out around Christmas time to meet his parents for the first time, and he's from Ontario. So I landed and he took me to see Niagara Falls because I'd never seen it before. And it was, it was really pretty and it was winter, so everything was like covered in ice crystals. And so we got into his parents' house. His parents had never seen the Grand Canyon at the time. And we get there like, oh, how's Niagara Falls? I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. And they're like, how does it compare to the Grand Canyon? And I was like, <laughs> is that a real question? Um, the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Anyways, so I think subsequently when they saw the Grand Canyon, they knew why it was hard for me to answer that question. But also when I growing up in northern Arizona, 
every year we had to go to the Grand Canyon. That was our field trip. I was like, oh, the Grand Canyon again. We'd all be like complaining, like, oh, the Grand Canyon. And then every time we get off the bus and see it and just be blown away every time. It's, I feel like that's got to be, it's kind of similar to here, right? My kids complain about the field trips that they go on to all this stuff in D.C. And then we'll talk to people from outside the area and they're like, you went to the Kennedy Center on a field trip? And they're like, (laughs) and my son will be like, well, we had to watch, you know, whatever play we had to watch. It was terrible. And uh, it's, it's, your perception gets a little skewed by being close proximity to something like that. Yeah. So Obviously, the Grand Canyon, you know, you got the word grand in it. That's the big gun, right? Yeah. Is there another underrated site in Arizona that people should go to, either National Park Service or something that's been overlooked by the NPS? What what is what should be at the top of their list when they come to Arizona? Um, what I never did as a child and have discovered now as an adult is this. It's called Boyce Thompson Arbore- Arboretum in like 45 minutes east of Phoenix. And so it's out like kind of in the base of these mountains and they have plants and trees from all over the world, like a lot from Australia and just different arid environments. And it's so beautiful and there's little hiking trails out there. It's absolutely stunning. So I just, it's like peaceful and everyone out there is lovely. So I think it's so unique to see all of those plants together. And it's just a little treasure out close by to Phoenix. So I always recommend people go out there. And so hopefully all of our viewers will go check that out the (laughs) next time they are out there. So now the thing that we teased at the beginning of the show, (laughs) did your PhD work at Arizona State? Of course, that is the home of CBBG, which I I never get the words right. (laughs) I can remember the acronym, though. Thanks, Ed. And (laughs) what what is the strangest example of bio-inspired geotechnics that you saw while you were at Arizona State? Okay, so this starts with a story from high school. So when I was in high school, my cousin and I were in science class, and we're 10 days apart. and very close. So we had the science class, and we had to do a report. And for some reason... We chose to do our report on the naked mole rat, which is this very strange rat that lives underground. It's like amazing tunneling. Um, and it's like naked, basically. It has no fur. So we chose to do this for some unknown reason. So the day we had to give the presentation, we came in and we had our poster to present. But we also had a little cave with a naked mole rat in it. We like had it covered. And so after we presented our poster, we said, do you guys want to see a naked mole rat? We ordered one. From the local pet store and everyone's like oh okay so we turned out the lights and we took the the sheet off and the students came up one by one we're like you see it in there so then our teacher comes up who's also our track coach we're like oh mr schuler do you want to hold the naked mole rat like, oh yeah so we take the lid off and as he's sticking his hand in we like shove the cage up <laughs> coming out of him. and he shrieked like a toddler in front of everyone and we're like just rolling on the ground laughing. We're like, of course it was a naked mole rat. How would we get that? It was a hot dog with like peppercorns. <laughs> <laughs> like it <laughs> the whole thing was a prank. So anyway, he never forgave us. And it's just like a living legend at our high school. So um, anyway, flash forward over 20 years later, just a month ago, I'm sitting in the CBBG annual meeting and they're talking about bio-inspired tunneling ideas. And this slide goes up. Bio-inspired tunneling, inspired by naked mole rats. I was like, what the heck? So I take a picture, send it to my cousin. I'm like, the naked mole rat strikes again. <laughs> so you didn't, but you didn't have to tell the story during the meeting. No, I didn't get to tell. You the didn't story. choose to. I feel like that would have been that. That's not something that you get an opportunity to tell. I know. Very frequently. I know they don't come up a lot, but um, Ed runs those. Like it's the NSF. They're on clockwork. So there's no time for for this one. But. Can you well, believe now you're gonna now you're gonna have to share all that with him if he hasn't heard the story <laughs> already. He's gonna want more detail. <laughs> the prank of my life. To make him <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I, I, we were we were never that good. It was more like telling the there was this Olive Garden we always stopped at on the way home from field trips, and we would always say that the it was the teacher's birthday, and that's about as wild as it got for us. I feel like. yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, we went through it real deep on that one. The hot dog playing the naked mole rat. That's pretty good. (laughs) So we got two questions left. 
And I, I hope this one made you think, because usually you have to ask somebody else for this one. What facial expression do you make that is most unique to you? Um, I'm not totally sure, but I do know that my kids like are often like, you look like you're mad, but you're happy. Or you look happy, but you're actually mad. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Some sort of like, my facial expressions don't match. But it's never something. it's never been captured on video or so. even camera. You got to yeah. get that. I, f- I, I feel like, are you the type of person that somebody can look? Well, obviously not. If they think <laughs> this, where they can look at you and they can read what's going on, or <laughs> or is this a common theme for you that nobody can ever figure it out? No, I guess that's not. I guess uh, at work, um, working in the oil sands actually like one of my first big projects. Uh, I felt like our consultant was not doing great work and I was just like sitting there pretty angry <laughs> and afterwards my boss was like Kimberly you gotta like we can all see how angry <laughs> like, well and maybe happy. maybe maybe that's what inspired you to turn over a new lease yeah like, then now, I, now I don't match it's very confusing I'm trying to please everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, that's pretty good. I because I always think that I am giving everything away, and then people will be like, "No, we can't tell." And, oh, <laughs> keep it up. That's it's a, it's an important <laughs> skill as a as a team leader, you know. <laughs> so the the final one we have to ask you: you've been super active in our Arizona chapter over the past several years. What and you now you're on the local involvement committee, as we mentioned at the beginning. What is your favorite thing about being active in a local GI group? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this. I think it's mostly the connections you make. It's so fun to get to see people and find out what they're working on and hear their stories. But I had a fun case when I was doing my PhD and we really wanted to get some CPDs done at our like field test site at ASU. And Ed was like, well, they don't do CPTs in Arizona and everyone knows that because our soil is too good. So you can't push a CPT in the ground. I was like, oh, we really need one. But we were at um, the Cross USA lecture with Paul Main and Contech was sponsoring. And so the guys from Contech were there. I was like, oh, I really wish you had CPT rigs in Arizona. I want to use one on for my research. And they were like, we have them in Arizona all the time for the mines, for the mine tailing. Oh. They're like, we'll get one to your site. No problem. So like a month later, this giant CPT rig shows up at the at the site. I mean, giant because... It's like a small little field test, <laughs> the rig, the whole thing. And then they sent this really old one. They're like, Kimberly, we're sorry, we sent the old one. And and then Dr. Kevin's engine comes out. He's like, oh, my gosh, I remember that rig. When you first got it, it was on my site 30 years ago. <laughs> memories. I was like, wait, I think we had that up in Canada. Like, this rig had been <laughs> So she, great. So if like I had, a, yeah, go ahead. Double shout out to Cone Tech there, making it happen in Arizona and uh, bringing back the nostalgia. Yeah, exactly. Um, of course, it didn't have air conditioning, which was really unfortunate for the guys <laughs> doing the work. But um, yeah, it was so cool. Like I wouldn't, that conversation wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been just for that local meeting and just meeting new people. So I think that's the really special part of it. And now that we've had our first big get together again, back in person mm-hmm. and we had a happy hour after our annual symposium and everyone was just so happy to see each other and get back together. It's really fun. So she's a great segue there. It's been amazing to get out and see people this fall, even in a limited capacity. We haven't been as many places as we would be normally, but we're starting to get out there or geo extreme. I was at Orvis in Cincinnati a few weeks ago and Hershey back in September. Didn't make it out to Phoenix for, for the Arizona one, which I'm kind of bummed about, but there's always next year, I think. So yeah. if you are not a member of your local chapter, again, go to geoinstitute.org. You can contact us. We'll help you find your local group. We can even connect you with the leadership and away you will go. We have almost 60 local chapters across the U.S. So the odds are really good that wherever you are, there is a local group. <laughs> and before somebody contacts us from Hawaii and says, do we have a local group in Hawaii all the way out here? I will tell you, yes, there is a Hawaii <laughs> chapter, so you can join it. So Kimberly, you have survived all the questions of Director's Cut. And again, everybody survives, but still it is a notable <laughs> achievement. 
and uh, thank you so much for doing this today. I think it was fun. A lot of fun, yep. And if you viewers liked what you saw, again, click subscribe, click get notifications. You will know every single time we post something to the YouTube channel, which is very frequently. Director's Cut goes up every week on Wednesday. Next week will be our very special Thanksgiving episode, so you will want to tune in for that. And we will see all of you in a week. Have a great week. Thanks, bye.